This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. Gdansk, Northern Poland, 1983. For the last eight years, a serial sex killer known as the Scorpion has preyed on women in the area. Yolanta, a 19-year-old seamstress, is on her way home. She is about to become the Scorpion's 20th victim. Scorpion caught up with her and propositioned her, asking to have sex with her. Yolanta refuses and tries to run away. He ran after her. After about 200, 300 meters, he attacked her. With Yolanta on the ground, the attacker runs back to collect her bag. He returns and proceeds brutally to attack and kill the 19-year-old. He smashed her skull, hitting her 14 or 15 times with a one and a half kilogram hammer, completely massacring that young girl. It was a terribly brutal murder. He took off her underwear. He put his fingers into her vagina and brought himself to orgasm. Yolanta's body is found the next morning by the owner of the land. The police have a serial killer on the loose. The pressure is on to catch him before he strikes again. A dedicated police team has been established it's called Special Group Scorpion. Andre Gavrish is the lead investigator. The team soon discover how the Scorpion attacks. He attacked with the element of surprise. He usually struck effectively and would leave a victim behind while he quietly and unobserved would disappear. This actively reflects a scorpion, so that's where the name came from. We are dealing with a very dangerous criminal, assaulting women sexually. Stefan Szanowski is head of the special group. He did not rape those women or have sexual intercourse with them. He just played with their sex organs. He would undress their lower parts and play in such a way. With a killer roaming the area, locals in the city of Gdansk and the surrounding villages are on edge. Men began to collect their wives from work and their daughters from school. Zbigniew Szykowski is a crime reporter for the local newspaper. There was absolute panic. People were terrified about where the scorpion would strike next. One thing has to be said. The scorpion did not leave many traces. He was a very difficult opponent for the special group. But in March 1983, the Scorpion makes a rookie mistake, which will lead the police right to his door. We are talking about a very important event, which led to the identification and arrest of the perpetrator. The Scorpion has stolen a van and is driving from Gura to Dombrovka when he spots 25-year-old via Suava in her home. He waits until she leaves her house to go to work. Then he runs her over. 
He rammed her hard enough to have her fall into a nearby ditch. The killer grabs the unconscious Fiasuava and throws her into the back of the stolen van. He drives to a secluded forest road and assaults her. He hit her a few times in the head with the hammer. She fell and so he proceeded to satisfy himself. He played with her. When he was satisfied, he got in the van and wanted to drive away. But got stuck in the mud. So he left the van. Amazingly, Villasuava survives the vicious assault. bizarre series of connections and the unlikeliest of evidence. Pig feces left in the van lead them to Harvel Tuklin, a 37-year-old smallholder and electrician, the Scorpion. Andre Gavrish arrests him at his farm and takes him in for questioning. During this questioning, he admitted to one murder and then another attempted murder to the recent incident. After eight years, the so-called Scorpion is finally behind bars. Faced with overwhelming evidence collected at his home, Pavel Tuklin eventually confesses to nine murders and eleven assaults. But he claims that he did not know that he had killed anyone because the women's bodies were warm when he left them. Tuklin did not particularly go out to kill someone. His major motivation was in fact to gratify himself, to, to enact out his fantasies. That is his primary motive. The fact that he had to subdue his victims um, was just part and parcel of that. And it was to some degree incidental, particularly initially, as to whether they lived or died. To understand exactly how the murders were committed, police take Tuklin back to the scenes of his crimes. At each location, he reenacts his vicious attacks. You have to be an animal to behave like that. To hammer somebody in the head without any hesitation, that is just something truly hideous. And he acted like that to please himself. Or as he said, to have sexual fun. That is monstrous. He didn't seem to care. There were no feelings of guilt. He was a calm, cold-blooded rascal. The attacks are so depraved, questions are raised over Tuklin's sanity. A team of forensic experts question him to make a judgment. They discover that Pavel Tuklin, the killer known as Scorpion, is driven by perverse sexual urges stemming from his childhood. Between 1975 and 1983, Pavel Tuklin, the serial sex killer known as the Scorpion, assaults 20 women. He murders nine of them. On May 31st, 1983, police arrest him. Now, eight years after his attacks began, Tuklin is in custody. A team of forensic experts question the killer. We fully realized the seriousness of the situation, and whether he would be sentenced to death or not depended on our assessment. Jerzy Popocha, 
leads the psychological examination to discover what drove Pavel Tuklin to commit such horrific crimes. The team must go back to his childhood. Tuklin's biography is extremely important because it explains the genesis of his criminal activity. The murders and that kind of sexual abuse of women. Pavel Tuklin is born in 1946 in a small village of Kura outside Gdansk, Poland. His father is an abusive alcoholic. He beats his son without mercy. His father beat him relentlessly, to such an extent that he cut his mind off from reality. The greater the beating, the more he became reluctant to make human contact. Growing up in such an environment could have led the Scorpion's psychological understanding and personality to change and cause extreme aggression in his adult life. The abuse and cruelty Tuklan experiences as a child would play a key role in his murderous future. It may also be responsible for him wetting the bed, something he continued to do well into his teens. The reasons for bedwetting are mainly related to stress and anxiety. This was the case of Pavel Tuklin, who wet his bed till the age of 15 or 16, which completely defied the norm. It was well-known information in the village, so the girls made fun of him and mocked him. I remember, he once said girls didn't want to date him because he smelled horrible, of urine. As Tuklin becomes a teenager, he begins to stalk women and voyeuristically spy on them. It's an early stage in a perverse sexual life that will lead, in time, to murder. He was a peeping Tom. He did it according to the saying, necessity is the mother of invention. He desired to engage with women. In practice, it was impossible. So he found another way, not directly, but indirectly, at a distance. But at least he had eye contact with them. Tuklin now begins to demonstrate a personality disorder, which criminologists call paraphilia. Paraphilia stands for love of the beyond. It basically means that you get sexual gratification from something that is not considered normal or acceptable. Tuklin shows elements of paraphilia in that he seems to get off on voyeurism, watching others, on exhibitionism, exposing himself, and also progressively seems to have become attached to the idea of a completely passive, almost unconscious female. When Tuklin is 18 years old, he leaves the village of Kura and moves into the city of Gdansk, 60 kilometers away. He learns his trade as a builder and electrician. In 1973, Tuklin gets married and has a child. Tuklin clearly, at this point, could have had a normal existence. Unfortunately, his sexual predilections were such that he wanted a lot more that was not on offer. Tuklin's marriage fails, and two years later, he gets divorced. By 1975, he is consumed by his perverse sexual fantasies. He 
begins to look for a way to fulfill them. The killer, nicknamed the Scorpion, is about to strike for the first time. At some point, something changed in his personality. Tuchlin's predilections began to get a grip on him. His sexual needs were quite powerful and overriding. But unfortunately for the rest of society, he had clear psychopathic callous traits, which meant that when he felt that he wanted more, he actually went out and got it. He had a general plan in his head. This needed to be a single woman. The place must be safe in the sense that there shouldn't be any people around. The idea was to act effectively and safely. Tuflin used the phrase hunting. This is essentially what he was doing. He, he liked the thrill of the chase. He wanted to find victims randomly, chase them, um, and push them down onto the ground as you would a, an animal that you were bringing down in a hunt. On the 31st of October, 1975, Tuklin goes on the hunt for his first victim. He assaults 21-year-old Danuta, striking her on the back of the head with a hammer. He then fulfills his perverse desires. The attack sets a routine which he will follow for the next eight years. Somehow, some inner power pushed him out onto the streets, and he got a taste for it. After the first attack, he knew that there would be more, because he enjoyed it. What was once out of his reach, he could now obtain in a simple way. Whilst growing up, Tuklin witnessed farmers using hammers to knock out animals in the village. It's a brutally effective method, particularly when used on human beings. It was, as we called it, hammer anesthesia. So he just put them in a state of coma immediately. Between October 1975 and February 1976, Tuklin attacks three women. The attacks stop when, in 1976, Tuklin is convicted of theft from his workplace. He spends three years in jail. But the authorities are unaware of his previous crimes. So in 1979, Tuklin is freed to hunt again. On the 9th of November, he sets off with a hammer wrapped in a cloth. Later, Tuklin explained that he bandaged the hammer so it would not chill his stomach when he put it in his trousers, simply for comfort. By the river Radunia, he kills 20-year-old Irena with a hammer blow to the head. She is his fourth victim. True to form, he does not rape her. The need to watch was dominant in him. So there was no need for sexual intercourse. Tuklin did not get off on normal sex. He had uh, a paraphilia for um, masturbating over naked, stationary female. Um, this was his primary target. For him, 
to see a woman, to smell a woman, was extremely important. He said that during one of his contacts with a woman, he put his fingers to her vagina, and later, he did not wash his hand for two weeks, so that he could smell it and delight in it. Tuklin flees the murder scene, wading into the river before deciding it's too wide to cross. But accidentally, he drops the hammer. Police investigating the crime scene find the murder weapon lying in shallow water. The hammer was engraved with the initials ZNTK, which stands for the firm that deals with train carriage maintenance in Gdansk. This proved that the hammer had been taken from this firm. Police obtained lists from the company detailing everyone who had access to such hammers. Tuklin did work at ZNTK. But unfortunately, his name does not appear in the records. If his name had been on the list, then it is possible he would have been arrested after this murder. But that didn't happen. Police discover that locals hunt water rats in hammers wrapped in cloth to avoid damaging the fur. They conclude that the hammer may not be the murder weapon they were looking for. Pavel Tuklin, the scorpion, escapes the authorities once again. With Poland in the grip of profound social and political change, the four separate hammer attacks are not linked by police. You have to frame these events in the historical context that existed then. It was martial law. The police were more focused on finding and capturing dissidents. Tuklin, the scorpion, continues to hunt with impunity. He leaves little evidence for the police. But the aftermath of his murders reveal the true darkness of his character. In September 1980, after killing 21-year-old Cecilia, the so-called scorpion satisfies his sexual desires. This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. Then he searches her bag, taking trophies as is his habit. He would gratify himself primarily, and his behavior following this was actually kind of post-sex, not post-killing. He just simply rifled through the gear as if it was an opportunist jumble sale um, and took what he fancied and kept things that he liked. It is characteristic for the perpetrator to take some small items from their victims. 
They treat them as souvenirs of the crimes, which remind them of the event and help them to fantasize about it. They often refer to these items as trophies, just like hunting trophies. Tuchlin also finds some food, which he eats by Cecilia's body. Tuchlin was able to calmly eat during, after, and while someone was actually dying. He didn't have any guilt or remorse. He had gotten tired during the assault, so he had a snack. He seemed totally indifferent. He was not in the emotional world. He actually did not react to the death, the carnage and the suffering that he inflicted on others. In 1980, Tuchlin gets married for a second time to a woman named Regina. The couple move back to Tuklin's home village, Gura. They have a child together. Tuklin is a typical sex offender. Criminologists say that these are people with dual personalities. As a husband and a father, he was seen as a quiet man. He was caring and warm-hearted. His wife had no idea he was able to commit such crimes. However, when he was hunting, he was ruthless, fast and effective. Despite being newly wed, Tuklin's attacks continue. Six more women are set to be murdered before he is caught. December 1982. Pavel Tuklin, the serial sex attacker known as the Scorpion, continues to prey on women around the Polish city of Gdansk. He has viciously assaulted 15 women in total and brutally murdered seven of them. The police are treating the attacks as separate incidents. But that is about to change. The crucial event was the murder of a woman in Skarshevé. Pavel Tuklin went to a restaurant where he drank a shot of vodka. He was walking around Skarshevé looking for a woman to attack and to satisfy his sexual desire. Later that night on Skarshevé Street, Tuklin kills 23-year-old factory worker Bozena. It's the eighth murder by a hammer blow to the head in just three years. Then the people in charge acknowledged that there was a serial killer who was preying on women. We had warned them earlier but somehow this information got lost down the line. At the beginning of 1983, the police set up a new task force. Special Group Scorpion is born. If the group had been formed earlier, then several women could have been spared a lot of suffering. The special group get to work. They think the time is on their side. There had been long gaps between Pavel's attacks since 1975. After the murder in Skarshevé, we were betting that maybe he would lay low for a while. However, this was not the case. Just 11 days after the Scorpion group is formed, Pavel Tuklin goes hunting for his next victim. His target is 19-year-old Eva in the town of Rytel, near Gdansk. He took out his hammer and hit her a couple of times. 
He pleasured himself until he ejaculated. Again, Tuklin steals a trophy from Eva. But the timing of this attack shows that the scorpion is changing the way he operates. His cooling down period, the time between attacks, is becoming shorter and the assaults more frequent. The attacks were happening one after the other. The pressure was on to crack down and to work double hard because we didn't know when he would strike again. The escalation of Tuchling's killings once he returned to his home ground is probably a consequence of him feeling safe and knowing the territory. Miraculously, Eva survives the brutal assault and staggers to get help. She is able to tell the Scorpion group all she remembers of her attacker. Using her testimony and other witness reports, the team developed sketches showing what the killer might look like. We had three or maybe even four of them prepared by a graphic artist. They were sometimes very different from one another because no victim saw the perpetrator clearly. A long face he was thin, had high cheekbones, and he was rather sad. It's true he got the shape of the face and the creases right, but the rest was way off. Other than the sketches, the police have very few clues to guide them. But boot prints and the nature of his attacks give them some information. From observations and reports, we knew he must be quite a young man, very active, quite strong, and about 1 meter 80 centimeters tall. Tuklin was not a primitive murderer who left behind a mountain of evidence to catch him. The members of the special group were under a lot of stress. So we sat and waited for the next victim. With a new victim, there could be new evidence, and that could identify the suspect. They don't have to wait long. On the 28th of February 1983, Tuchlin commits a bizarre crime. Using a stolen van, he steals four piglets from a local farm. The next day, March 1st, Tuchlin is driving the stolen van when he sees an opportunity to attack another woman. This is where Tuklin changed tactics. For the first time, Tuklin uses a vehicle in an attack. He puts the unconscious Via Suava into the stolen van and drives her to a secluded spot. When he's finished assaulting his victim, he tries to drive away. the van gets stuck in the mud. Tuchlin is forced to leave it there and escapes on foot. When police search the abandoned van, they find something unusual in the back. Pig feces. They link the van to the theft of the four piglets. The tire tracks at the place where the piglets were stolen and the place where the victim was found were identical. 
the scorpion has left two significant clues for the investigators. We knew that the perpetrator owned pigs and therefore couldn't be from the city. Also, police now know he's a thief and that he knows how to hotwire a vehicle. Tuklin gives the piglets, along with various trophies taken from victims, to his second wife, who keeps them at their farm. But it is yet another theft which will lead to his capture. He needed a cooker to prepare food for the pigs in his sty. Tuklin's neighbor has a pig swill cooker. Brazenly, he steals it and brings it back to his own farm. His neighbor reported him, accusing him of stealing. Local police investigate Tuklin and file a report. This theft is said to be a fatal mistake for the scorpion. In March 1983, killer Pavel Tuklin uses a stolen van to attack 25-year-old Via Suava. Police find pig feces in the back of the vehicle. It's a vital clue which links the killer to the theft of four piglets. Now a pig swill cooker is reported missing. The owner accuses Tuklin of taking it. Local authorities file a report about the theft, putting Tuklin on the police radar. At the headquarters of Special Group Scorpion, a support worker notices the report and makes a vital connection. The woman who checked the information knew about the stolen piglets. So when she saw that information, she connected the dots and told us about it. She told us to watch that man because he could be the perpetrator. Detectives investigate 37-year-old Pavel Tuklin. They find that he has a criminal record for stealing and his face matches certain aspects of the witness sketches. Now, lead investigator Andre Gavrish goes to Tuklin's farm. On the 31st of May, 1983, we came here in three cars with the intention of arresting Pavel Tuklin. We entered here through this gate. There was none of this netting, no fencing at all. The moment he saw the police car at his premises, he thought it was about those stolen steamers. Pavel changed his clothes and got his ID. He calmly accepted their handcuffs and was led to the car and they drove off. It was as banal as can be. I was here for maybe 15 minutes, then we drove off, taking Tuklin with us. Police search the farm. They find a hammer stained with human blood. They also discover rings and watches stolen from the scorpion's victims. At the police station, Andre Gavrish questions Tuklin. I asked him how the rings had ended up in his house and whose they were. He lowered his head and took a couple of deep breaths. 
złapał oddech jeden. Tell us. Step by step, he told us everything and how it happened. Krok po kroku zaczął, zaczął mówić. Even the police admit it was Tuklin's careless mistakes which led them to him. If he hadn't stolen those steamers, we wouldn't have had the information. Usually, the perpetrator gets caught by making mistakes. There isn't such a thing as the perfect crime. It was Tuklin's thieving that helped us to catch him. Now, a team of forensic and psychological experts question Tuklin. Over three months, they delve into his history to determine if he is mentally incompetent. All of his deeds were analyzed. It's not only what the offender says about his actions, but what the action says about the offender. To develop evidence for the trial, Tuklin is taken by police to visit the scenes of his crimes. There he reconstructs his brutal assaults. He showed it on a beautiful young policewoman who acted out the role of the victim. Several times I saw the victim crumple her face as he pretended to hit her. That is how scared she was, even though it was a reconstruction and he was in handcuffs. Tuklin demonstrates his sexual perversions on a mannequin. He seems to enjoy it and even jokes with the officers. Tuchlin tam klęczał przy tym manekinie. Zwrócił się do prokuratora. Tuchlin was kneeling next to the mannequin and said, Mr. Prosecutor, I could demonstrate better if instead of this mannequin, I had this lady. And he pointed at a blonde. He believed he could demonstrate better what he had done. During one of the reconstructions, journalists approached the Scorpion and asked what he would do if he were ever released. He raised his head, looked at us, and with a little grin, slowly drawling his words, said, I would hunt. If only he had the opportunity, he would kill again. Even in custody, Tuklin cannot restrain his twisted sexual desires. While with us, he made female sex organs out of bread so that he could get sexual arousal. He even used hair. It proved how strong his need to watch was, so that even in prison, he decided to make a substitute of what he did in reality. The psychological investigation concludes that Tuklin is sane and fit to face trial. He was among the people who can be considered normal. There was in him a variant of normality. At the trial, Pavel Tuklin is found guilty of nine murders and 11 assaults. This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised.